Good day and welcome back to IndustryBroadcast.com's audio article number 56. Today's audio article is written by Chris Bateman, who is the game designer and writer, best known for his work on the games Discworld Noir and Ghost Master, founder and director of game design and narrative consulting company International Hobo, located at iHobo.com. He is also the author of two science fiction novels, co-author of 21st Century Game Design, published in 2005, which discusses the topic of game design in the context of player needs and play styles. He also edited Game Writing Narrative Skills for Video Games, which he was also a contributing author on two chapters. Many of the articles which we'll be reading on industry broadcasts will appear in modified form in an upcoming book which he co-authored and edited, titled Beyond Game Design, Nine Steps Towards Creating Better Video Games, published by Charles River Media. It will be available March the 16th, 2009, so head over to Amazon.com and pre-order a copy today. Audio article number 56, titled Between Stories and Games, written by Chris Bateman and read aloud by Ryan Wienko on January the 9th, 2009. Between Stories and Games Where is the boundary between a game and a story? While it is true that it is possible to make a game without a story, there are actually very few games which do not contain at least an implicit story, that being a narrative situation. Indeed, these framing narratives serve to define the play of the game in many cases. What then is the relationship between game and story? Let me begin by saying that I don't have an answer. Furthermore, the topic is so far from testable that it is likely that there is no single answer to the question and absolute certain that the answer one will encounter will depend deeply upon the definition of the terms game and story. For the sake of this discussion, however, I will use our standard definition of game, which is a tool for entertainment with some degree of performance. This may be something tangible like a victory or an end condition, or something intangible like the satisfaction of a tabletop role-playing game session that just seems to flow perfectly. For story, I will cast the net wide and define it as any account of events affecting one or more characters, real or fictitious, and for narrative, as the specific delivery of a details of a particular story instance. Now, what do people mean when they say games don't need stories? Because clearly there are lots of games with narrative content, and many of them arguably perform better in a marketplace through the inclusion of a narrative so it is not so much a commercial argument to claim that games don't need stories. I think perhaps they simply mean that the abstract, ludic content of a game can qualify as a game without a narrative of any kind. The clearest example is Tetris, which provides no narrative material at all in general terms. It is true that abstract games can avoid narrative entirely, but it is not the equivalent to saying that games don't need stories so much as it is saying that there are types of games which can avoid explicit narrative content. For instance, the game's don't-need-stories point is a view probably supported by Quake in its absence of story. Of course, Quake does have a story, a truthfully awful story, perhaps the worst ever written, but it hides it in a manual so that only a few of us have had a chance to share it in its appealing cheese. But it is not that Quake is devoid of narrative, Rather, the narrative situation that Quake presents is so inherently intuitive, kill all the monsters, that is, that it does not require any exposition. You could not remove this implicit narrative from Quake even if you wanted to. Even the highly abstract games have implicit narratives. Chess, for example, is built from the implicit narrative situation of two kingdoms at war. Understanding this narrative framework makes the game of chess easier to learn, because the idea that the game ends when the king is cornered follows the scenario quite naturally, and the exchange of pieces can be understood as an abstract battle. In the field of hobby games, practically all games make use of an implicit narrative to provide the backdrop for the game, with the express benefit that understanding the actions and the rules of the game become easier, because they have been given a context. Even a mass-market boxed game like Jenga has something of a narrative to it, the narrative of who will cause the tower to collapse, the innocent version of Russian roulette. Perhaps then even Tetris has something of a narrative to it. After all, there is the potential of telling someone the story of what happened in your particular game. One of the key values of a story in a game is that it simplifies the process of learning what to do in a game. 
when Resident Evil 4 set the narrative framework that our bland action hero is looking for the president's daughter, the modern version of the classical princess, we already know something of what to be expected of us. It is not necessary to flash up explicit mission instructions because our mission is derived from the narrative context. Indeed, one thing that the Resident Evil series has done very well is to draw the archetypal horror situation, thus letting the implicit elements of its narrative silently guide the player's actions. In terms of Célois's four types of games, games of Aegon can eliminate all narrative elements, except the implicit story of two individuals vying for victory. Games of Alia cannot eliminate the narrative implicit of fate, for this is the implicit meaning of chance in games. Although culturally our attitude to fate has changed recently, and we are more likely to dismiss this as chance, even though fate and chance are concepts that differ only in their mythology. Mimicry and narrative are intimately intertwined. Only Eilinks, games of vertical, seem to escape a narrative context, but even here there are potentially a counter-argument that can be made, just as we made for Tetris. Although explicit narrative elements can be removed from all games, it is much harder to remove the implicit elements of narrative. Huizinga suggests that play creates culture, and I sympathize with this point of view. All human activities can be expressed as a kind of game, of varying degrees of seriousness, of course, to the individuals involved. Similarly, all human activities can be recorded as a story, and Fraser, Campbell, and others have suggested that it is an underlying framework in our minds, which is adapted to accept and create stories. Is there a sense, therefore, that games and stories are counterparts of each other, that games create stories and stories frame games? At the moment, our technology creates games whose stories are severely limited. We do not have the technical complexity to support a game with implicit narrative as rich as a literary novel. And even if we did, we lack the widespread elegance of design to present such a game for a suitable audience. Sure, we could create a game with an explicit narrative with such complexity, but then we would not be telling the story of the game, but merely combining a complex narrative and a presumably simpler game altogether. It is also likely that the complexities of the narrative would not sit well alongside the play of such game, though making such an exercise fruitless. The art of making stories and games work together is to create each such that it is a complement of the other. Another analogy I can use would be the cast and mold of a fossil. The play of the game should naturally lead the player through the story. The story of the game should naturally lead the player through the appropriate play. The more identifiable human like the avatar, the more explicit a narrative the game will support. Perhaps this is the reason that games like Tetris seem markedly less narrative. It has no avatar, and therefore there is no character about whom to tell a story. Since we currently cannot make games of sufficient, that being accessible, complexity to rival the height of our best storytelling, perhaps we should then focus on the other side of the equation. Games produce play and implicit narrative. That being, we can look at ways of making these implicit narrative situations tie into an explicit narrative, thus deepening the sense of involvement, as well as mimicry of a game, and crucially of building dynamic explicit narratives which support whichever implicit narrative situation the player chooses to favor. The footprint of a game's implicit narrative should therefore fit the foot of the game's story, or vice versa. We do not praise the skills required to achieve this, which we have called narrative integration or design integrated narrative sufficiently within the game's industry. We still judge game stories by similar terms to conventional narratives. While there may be nothing wrong with this, we could perhaps benefit from identifying and praising those games which achieve an appropriate relationship between their play and their narrative. This concludes audio article number 56, once again written by Chris Bateman of www.ihobo.com. Just to reiterate, this and many of Chris's future articles on industrybroadcast.com appear in modified form in his new book, which he co-authored and edited, titled Beyond Game Design, Nine Steps Towards Creating Better Video Games, published by Charles River Media. As I mentioned before, it will be released on March the 16th, 2009, so head over to Amazon.com and pre-order your copy today. As always, we recommend that you check back frequently to industrybroadcast.com 
as we're doing our very best to update the site frequently, bringing the collective insight of the game.